This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's Wednesday, so that means it's time for another deck history video. In this series, I look at the history of deck archetypes that have been successful at Magic's highest level of competition, starting from the first time a particular deck emerged and ending with the modern day. I always run a poll that lets viewers have a say in what the topic of these videos will be, and in last week's poll, Psychotog decks were the winner. Psychotog decks get their name from the creature who was their primary win condition, Psychotog, who was lovingly referred to as Dr. Teeth, by his fans. Psychotog was originally printed in Odyssey as part of a cycle of new, multicolored Atogs who could gobble up various cards to increase their stats. The rest of the cycle is pretty bad, but not Psychotog. Psychotog is significantly better than the others in the cycle because its first ability allows you to discard cards to pump it, and that fuels the other ability, which exiles cards from the graveyard to pump it more. So, discarding a whole hand and exiling a whole graveyard can make a Psychotog absolutely massive. Actually, it's kind of funny that we looked at Necropotence decks last week and Psychotog decks this week, since both of them were cards that people thought were terrible at first, but then they would go on to disprove the haters fairly quickly by becoming so central to the strategies of decks in various formats that the decks are actually named for them. For Psychotog, people didn't like the idea of using so many resources to boost its stats for a single turn, and you can sort of see where they're coming from. And even when people did think about giving it all those resources, people didn't think it would be able to get large enough. And what if your opponent has removal? Of course, as we'll see, it really wasn't that hard to make Psychotog absolutely massive and protect it at the same time. Between 2002 and 2007, Psychotog decks found significant success in Block Standard and Extended, and in this video we'll take a look at the notable iterations of Psychotog decks over the years, examining how they changed over time and why. Psychotog decks first emerged in Odyssey Block Constructed at Pro Tour Osaka in 2002. Osip Lebedevich piloted his blue-black Psychotog deck to a top 8 finish, and his deck really showcased how one could abuse Psychotog as a control deck win condition. The deck sought to make the game go long by disrupting the opponent in various ways while chipping away with the Psychotog until the game reached a point where Psychotog was able to attack for lethal. In addition to running the typical counter magic card draw and removal of most control decks, there were also some special synergies that Psychotog could take advantage of, powering up various cards and Psychotog itself. This was true of cards with madness like Circular Logic and Obsessive Search, which Psychotog would let you discard easily. Circular Logic was especially nice because the deck had so much control over the number of cards in its graveyard that it was often just a one-mana hard counter. The deck was also filled with cards that you could get extra value out of, even if you discarded them without casting them. Chainer's Edict and Ether Burst are good examples of this. The Edict has flashbacks so you could utilize it in the later game, and Ether Burst became more potent the more Ether Bursts you had in your graveyard. Another key feature of the deck was its use of upheaval. Once the game had gone long enough, you could float enough mana to cast upheaval and then play Psychotog again. He would almost certainly be safe since your opponent is starting over at one mana, and most of the ways they could kill him would only be damage based, and you could just pump him if that was the case. Then on your next turn you would finish the opponent off as a result of all the cards in your hand and in your graveyard. Osip's deck featured many of the components that would continue to be part of Psychotog decks in Standard and Extended. However, as is usually the case, this was the only block Pro Tour, so Psychotog decks were never given another chance at a top 8 in that format. Let's move now to Standard, where Psychotog was the most dominant deck of 2002. We already saw how powerful Psychotog decks could be, even when just limited to Odyssey blocks, so as you can imagine, Standard provided some new toys for Psychotog to play with. About two months after the Block Pro Tour, Psychotog decks would emerge in Standard, where three of them placed in the top eight of Grand Prix Milwaukee. Two of the decks were blue-black Psychotog, with a foundation very similar to the one we saw top eight at the Block Pro Tour. One of these was piloted by Brian Kibler. This, of course, included a bunch of counter magic and card draw along with upheaval, but there were some cards legal and standard that really powered up the deck, including two cards that added substantially to your graveyard and your hand, something Psychotog decks are all about. Those cards were Factor Fiction and Probe. Factor Fiction was the more powerful of the pair. With it, no matter what your opponent did, you were going to get some nice cards in your hand and put a lot of fuel in your hand and graveyard for Psychotog. Probe didn't do a bad job of it either, as for only 3 mana it could dig you deeper into your deck while loading up your graveyard, and later in the game you could even kick it. 
Another notable card is Nightscape Familiar. This little zombie made it so all your spells were cheaper, and obviously that went a long way towards helping the deck load up the graveyard, draw a bunch of cards, and protect Psychotog. Neil Reeves also top aided Grand Prix Milwaukee with a somewhat different take on Psychotog. It did have a lot of similarities to what we've already seen, including Upheaval, Factor Fiction, Nightscape Familiar, and Probe, but there was one big difference. The deck added red, which was pretty nice. Flame Tongue Kavu was one of the best creatures in the format because it could come down and kill things, and gaining access to it was a big deal. It also allowed him to play the powerful Split Card, Fire, and Ice. From here on in Standard, most decks would either be the blue-black Psychotog deck or the three-color Psychotog deck that added red to gain access to Flame Tongue Kavu and some other powerful cards. These decks would also go by names like Burning Tog and Red Psychotog. Less than two months after Grand Prix Milwaukee, multiple players piloted Psychotog decks to a top eight at a Standard event. This event was Grand Prix Taipei, and all three of them were these red Psychotog decks, but they went deeper into red than Neil Reeves did. Instead of just running two Flame Tongue Kavus, these decks went for the full four. Since the card was so good, there really wasn't a reason not to be playing that many. Another key feature of this deck was the use of Burning Wish, a card that would let you grab a sorcery out of your sideboard. One of the nice features of running the Wish was that it meant you didn't need to run mainboard upheavals, which could be pretty bad if you drew it at the wrong time. Instead, you could just wish for upheaval when it was the time to use it, in addition to being able to grab other situationally powerful cards. The deck also used Merfolk Looter, a creature that could help you find what you needed while also being another discard outlet and loading up the graveyard for your Psychotog. The other two decks to top eight this event were not drastically different, though the other two did also run Terminate, while Albertus Law's version did not. One month after Grand Prix Taipei, it was time for the 2002 World Championships. When all was said and done there, six of the top eight decks were Psychotog decks. Two of them were Burning Tog decks that didn't deviate much from Albertus Law's version of the deck, but the other four went back to the traditional Flame Tongue Kavulus Blue Black Tog build, though with a few new additions. For example, Dave Humphreys included Wonder in his deck, which was pretty awesome because it would allow your Psychotog to gain flying, making it much more of an immediate threat. Also, because the deck didn't run red, it didn't have access to Burning Wish, but it was able to play Cunning Wish. And while it couldn't grab you an upheaval out of the sideboard, there were plenty of useful things it could get for you, with Factor Fiction or Counter Magic being some of the most powerful things to grab. 2002 would mark the end of Psychotog dominance in Standard, though. Invasion Block rotated out in October of 2002, and it took some key cards with it, most notably Factor Fiction and Nightscape Familiar. Psychotog decks did continue to exist in Standard, but as a considerably powered-down version that never top-aided another Standard premiere event before Psychotog itself rotated out of the format. However, there was a format where all those cards, and some others, were still legal, and that was Extended. A now defunct format, Extended was a rotating format that featured the last several years of sets, and it would be the format where Psychotog would manage to have the most sustained success, as it didn't top 8 events anywhere else after 2002. Psychotog found its first extended top 8 at Pro Tour Houston in 2002, just a few weeks after the last Psychotog deck top 8 at Standard. This deck was piloted by Peter Mirvig, and it was mostly composed of cards we've already seen a lot of in this video, like Factor Fiction, Upheaval, and obviously Psychotog. It also utilized Cunning Wish and Wonder. The deck did feature three key cards, though, that had never been legal and standard when Psychotog was. Accumulated Knowledge, Brainstorm, and Intuition. Knowledge was a great way to draw cards and get value out of your graveyard, and Brainstorm was a great way to try to find your Psychotog or other key pieces, while Intuition was sort of a mini factor fiction in that it simultaneously gave you cards in your hand and in your graveyard. These cards were all typical in Psychotog decks when they were an extended together. Later in 2002, Anton Johnson top-aided Grand Prix Reims with a Psychotog deck that made one important addition, and that was Gush. This card was so good with Psychotog that you'll sometimes see this version of the deck referred to as Gushatog. Gush was exactly what Psychotog decks wanted, and something of a mini upheaval if you paid the alternate cost of bouncing lands to your hand. Because it added four cards to your hand and put Gush into the graveyard, it could, all on its own, contribute six and a half damage to your Psychotog, and that was a lot. Gush became a fixture in extended Psychotog decks as long as it remained in the format. Having access to Gush, Factor Fiction, Intuition, and Upheaval could really help you assemble lethal damage with Psychotog, with relative ease. Psychotog decks would undergo their next significant change at Pro Tour New Orleans in 2003. Now, Mirrodin was an extended, and Tomohiro Yokosuka 
prominently featured two of these new cards in his version of the deck. One of these was Chrome Mox, which gave the deck access to some nice fast mana, but the most notable addition was Isochron Scepter. This little artifact allowed you to imprint a two mana instant on it, and then the Scepter could make a copy of that card for only two mana. You can see that this strategy led to this deck only running two Psychotogs, and that's partly because the deck wasn't quite as focused on that strategy, instead putting some significant effort into making Isochron Scepter work. You could imprint Counter Magic on it, which was pretty nasty, but the spiciest thing to imprint on it was actually Fire and Ice, because at the time the rules said it had a converted mana cost of two, and every time you made a copy of it, you could choose which side you wanted, and because the Fire side was Burn, that side of the card could be a win condition all on its own. This doesn't work any longer today as they've recently changed the rules for determining the mana value of split cards. The deck could also use Cunning Wish to grab Orem's Chant, another card that is amazing and oppressive on the Scepter. In short, this deck featured two win conditions in both Psychotog and the Scepter. The next major change Psychotox would undergo was more drastic. At Pro Tour Los Angeles in 2005, three Psychotog decks top aided the event, but they were all significantly different from one another. Of these, Billy Moreno's deck was the one that departed the most wildly from what earlier Psychotog decks had been. For a long time, Psychotog had been a control deck win condition, but Billy top-aided the Pro Tour with an aggro deck featuring Psychotog. Aggressive Madness decks had long been a thing and extended at this point, but Billy was the first to jam Psychotog into the deck. These decks were built around free discard effects and then putting creatures into play cheaply or for free, like Arrogant Worm and Basking Rootwalla. Psychotog was no longer the sole win condition for the deck, which featured a total of 20 creatures. There were a few cards in the deck, though, that were particularly spicy with Psychotog. By 2005, Ravnica cards were around, and this meant that Billy's deck had access to dredge cards like Dark Blast and Life from the Loam, which could help fuel the Tog. Additionally, his version of the deck ran Gifts Ungiven instead of Factor Fiction, because it was better at searching up specific cards like the ones with dredge. Meanwhile, Kenji Samura top aided the same Pro Tour with a version of the deck that was a more traditional Psychotog control deck, except that it made heavy use of Dredge and Gifts Ungiven, hence gaining the name Dredgetog. And lastly, Antoine Ruel top aided the event with more of a back to basic Psychotog deck that was interested in neither Dredge nor being aggressive, and instead had the usual plan of just countering and killing everything while you draw a bunch of cards before then killing the opponent with Psychotog. So, Psychotog decks of various builds dominated Extended pretty consistently for several years, but Odyssey Block was scheduled to rotate in 2007, so time was running out for Dr. Teeth. However, there would be one more Psychotog variant to emerge in Extended before he left the format forever. And that deck was piloted by Ryo Ogura, who top aided Grand Prix Singapore in 2007. In a lot of ways, this deck was a throwback to a typical Psychotog deck. It ran Factor Fiction, a bunch of Counter Magic, and a bunch of Card Draw. It ran a few more creatures than most of the more controlling Psychotog variants did, but not by a lot. It added the relatively new Dark Confidant for even more card draw, and also featured Maloku the Clouded Mirror as a potential win condition. Maloku plus Psychotog could also be a formidable combination, because you could add a bunch of damage in the air by using Maloku's ability, which returns lands to your hand, and then have more cards to discard to Psychotog's ability. However, the biggest change this deck made was the addition of the Counterbalance and Sensei's Divining Top combination. These two cards together were able to allow Psychotog decks to counter a whole lot of spells without actually using up cards, which just meant more fuel for Psychotog going forward. Countertop would go on to be its own archetype in multiple formats, but unfortunately, Psychotog rotated out of Extended, and it isn't played in the more traditional Countertop decks. And since that fateful day at Grand Prix Singapore, it hasn't top aided any more events, so it hasn't really been a relevant Magic card since 2007. Still, it was a dominant card between 2002 and 2007, especially in Extended, and it certainly left a mark on the game that is pretty difficult to forget. It certainly is a contender for one of the best control deck win conditions of all time, as a result of all that success. Well, that completes my history of Psychotog decks. There won't be a new episode next week, as I will be busy with my Adventures of Forgotten Realms limited review, but I'll be back the week after that. The poll is already up for that deck history video, so don't forget to vote. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future episodes, don't forget to subscribe, and if you want to catch up on the other deck histories I've already done, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.